This is a basic ankle and foot ultrasound talk. This is by no means a comprehensive lecture, uh, including all orthogonal planes, but more or less a description of um, what we normally look for when doing routine exams of the foot and ankle. We'll start off with the Achilles tendon in the posterior ankle. It's very easy to ultrasound because all of the tendons are very superficial and longitudinally oriented. And the tendon and thesis is very superficial and shallow, and it makes it very easy to appreciate where the tendon is inserting. Other landmarks here are the Kager's fat pad and the retrocalcaneal bursa. Um, not mentioned here is the retroachilles bursa, which sits just here superficial to the enthesis of the uh, Achilles tendon and deep to this fatty tissue on the posterior part of the heel. Here's an MRI showing uh, a disrupted Achilles tendon uh, with an ultrasound correlation. So basically what we're looking at on the MRI are these defects that are letting fluid invade the tendon with the uh, very swollen tendon fibers. Uh, notice that the footprint is overall intact and as we see over here on the ultrasound correlation it's very very similar. We see all this disrupted uh, fibers, uh, discontinuity, the overall architecture is uh, severely displaced and as we look at this tear even further on uh, orthogonal scanning or transverse scanning in this case, we're going to take a sweep through the Achilles tendon to its enthesis transversely and also note that here in the ultrasound. Um, one word of caution here is to use lots of gel because you do not want to use um, um, a sparing amount of gel and then you end up trying to maintain transducer contact on the skin and that pressure of just trying to maintain transducer contact will collapse useful pathology. So you'll notice in a lot of these slides when we found areas that are just overall uh, really nice disruptions that we've built up extra gel on the corners of the screen and you can see even the superficial sural vein is not collapsed and that's just another example of seeing an image that is not over compressed and we're not going to lose our pathological detail that way so all these intra-substance areas that are letting fluid in would otherwise be collapsed if we were to give too much transducer pressure so you can see the um, enthesis was noted here with the arrow pointed here and we don't see fibrillar disruption just yet and then mid-substance of the insertion, um, just shallow to the malleolar level, we start to see this extreme thickening of the overall tendon, but it's not diffuse like tendinosis. This is uh, swelling of the tendon. Its diameter has changed um, drastically. Then here, the fibers themselves become a little bit more separated, a little less involved with connective tissue, and they're very disrupted. Uh, and then here we see a complete um, rupture of fibers in the central portion of the tendon and then here it starts to swell back out again much like we see on the MRI. Here we've got a couple of other examples of point tenderness and what uh, differential diagnosis can be made there posterior to the Achilles uh, or anterior to the Achilles and posterior to the calcaneus would be the presence of a undersurface tear or an anterior margin tear of the enthesis or a retrocalcaneal bursitis. So you don't want to overlook these two and ultrasound provides a great way to classify this. Note on the Achilles tear, um, the swelling of the tendon fibers as we approach the enthesis uh, versus here the very normal fibular architecture of the Achilles tendon as it goes to its enthesis. And here the very painful, um, very, very circumscribed cystic looking structure of the retrocalcaneal bursa and don't forget to throw your color on both of these to see at what stage of vascularity uh, we may or may not have. Other forms of swelling if you run your finger across the tendon body and you may feel focal swelling and you might wonder what stage of pathology you're dealing with. This is um, intrasubstance longitudinal tearing where you can actually see disruptions of the Achilles but it's longitudinal tearing so these fibers are not retracting away from each other, but they are separating from each other um, in their longitudinal axis. Now as we go down to the middle image, probably something that were to happen if it's left unaddressed is scarring. And we see this disruption and disorganized collagen that has filled in uh, very likely an old tendon defect. This is not likely to be very new. You can throw color on and see if it's got any hyperemia. But you notice that the tendon architecture shows swelling like a belly here in the tendon uh, where it's nice and parallel 
going towards the anthesis and as we climb up towards the gastroc area you actually see um, the focal swelling with this um, what will probably be a calcium deposit if left unaddressed. Now a more mature um, calcium deposit that shows shadowing is, is seen here. So we have what's called a posterior acoustic shadow and that is right here on the superficial surface of the Achilles tendon. This almost looks like a tophus. Uh, these things are very common when we look at old injuries, people that are athletes or former athletes, um, when they've had Achilles tendon strains. Uh, we see these calcium deposits pop up all over the tendon, um, and we just equate those with old scars that have eventually um, solidified and then calcified, and then as they become more mature, they'll actually cast a shadow much like cortical bone. Plantar fascia. So on the plantar fascia, the scanning pearl is not to scan midline in the heel. If you scan midline in the heel, your transducer will actually sit between a lateral cord that goes to the base of the fifth metatarsal, amongst other fibers of the rest of the fascia, and the medial cord, which is the one that everybody typically has injuries to. So you want to stay on the medial calcaneal tubercle, and you'll notice that's in the photograph here. We're leaning the transducer medially, but we're aiming the beam back towards the calcaneus. So you can't just take a perfect slice in a uh, sagittal cut through the body or you'll just get soft tissue. You have to aim that beam back into the calcaneus so that you get this image here. There are standard measurements for the plantar fascia which are not shown in the PowerPoint, but I do just want to describe them here where uh, the distance between this cleft here where the anthesis of the plantar fascia, or the origin of the plantar fascia I should say, stops at the neck of the calcaneus and the superficial margin here should not exceed four or five millimeters on anybody regardless of their size. And, uh, and we see these really nice fibers not disrupted. Another thing to note is that we can see the neck of the calcaneus very well. If you do not see the neck of the calcaneus and all you see is the cortical margin of the calcaneus come out to a very sharp and abrupt shadow where the neck of the calcaneus goes under the shadow, you could be dealing with a very large bone spur. The fat pad of the heel is also a diagnostic and very useful feature to this exam and we will mobilize that here shortly to delineate um, the superficial soft tissue. Here's a couple of examples of pathology. We have a fibromatoma here on the superficial margin or the inferior surface of the plantar fascia. You notice that the anthesis is fine but they still had a lot of pain. And so these are little fatty growths that are adhered to the um, plantar fascia. Here we've got a complete rupture. So you can see the stump of the plantar fascia or portions of the stump depending on the slice that we take. We also see the fat pad herniating into the tear site. So the fat pad on this normal image here it's nice uh, and, and follows the contour of the, fat of the plantar fascia surface whereas here you can actually see the fat pad herniating into the tear site. Um, this will be very painful to compress so I would just advise doing that with caution. Um, but if you were to apply just a little bit of pressure, you would probably notice that the fat pad would even herniate um, further. And in many cases, this fat pad would actually bottom out on the calcaneus itself. Down here we have uh, plantar fasciitis. So this is pretty typical to find. Uh, make sure that it is on a unilateral and not bilateral. So you get chronic pain and chronic athletes or people rehabbing old uh, foot and ankle injuries, sometimes we'll see a little swelling on both plantar fascia and we just want to make sure that it's um, not just normal for that patient's anatomy to have focal swelling here and there, but what we're looking at is a very distinct difference between the right and the left side of the same patient where the right side is uh, definitely normal, looks nice, um, the superficial margin of the plantar fascia is nice and flat, it's not uh, abruptly distended, it's not tinted up, and the inferior margin of the plantar fascia to the image here is nice and parallel and it's not bowing away from the transducer. Whereas here we have both. We have a very sharp upward tinting of the plantar fascia and then on the inferior margin away from the transducer we have this belly looking bulge of the uh, plantar fascia to the inferior musculature that, that rests here. So this is a case study of a climber, somebody that uh, does a lot of hiking, a lot of outdoor activity and at first glance when we set the transducer down the plantar fascia looked fine. Uh, I expected to see this big swollen plantar fasciitis just like we saw on the last slide but we didn't see that. But I did notice this weird hypoechoic cleft 
that existed above the calcaneus and as much um hiking as I do, it, d it did make sense for me to go ahead and compress until um, the patient felt a little bit of pain. So we did this and you see the fat pad actually split apart from each other. And what that is, is consistent with a contusion to this fat pad where the fat pad is separated. And you can only imagine the lack of cushion between the skin and the shoe and the underlying rocks or whatever they're climbing, cramming right down on this edge of the calcaneus. And you're starting to see a little bit of intrasubstance tearing forming just probably due to an abnormal amount of stress on the, on the plantar fascia. But intrasubstance um, deformities are not uncommon. And then we throw on the color just to confirm those results with very light pressure. You'll notice the pressure difference of the fat pad from the skin down to the surface of the plantar fascia versus the skin uh, even at rest over here. So what you want to do is avoid, if you're going to use color on your ultrasound machine, avoid over compression of the tissue or you will collapse these very useful vessels. Another thing to do is confirm your pathology in both planes. But before you do that, you need to be observant of an artifact called anisotropy. This is an angle artifact that occurs when you do not cut the tissues at 90 degrees. And as you tilt the transducer up to about 7 degrees, uh, the plantar fascia or any other linear longitudinal oriented surface in the body will tend to shadow like this. This is a useful thing to use in, um, in plantar fascia ultrasound in particular. Because when we go into the transverse plane, you'll notice that the plantar fascia looks a lot like the overlying fat. And it's hard to tell what's what. So the fibers or the uh, fibroadipose tissue here superficially is not longitudinally oriented, so it doesn't respond to the angle artifact like the longitudinally oriented fibers of the plantar fascia. So when we tilt the transducer this way, you get a shadow that makes up the borders of the plantar fascia. So if you're wondering where to inject or where not to inject, where to land your needle uh, coming in from either side, you can either land your needle within the fascia or underneath the fascia you would like to avoid injecting above the fascia because you could get a fatty necrosis. Let's move on to the perineal tendons. Um, as you can see, the transducer orientation is this relatively axial to the body, and we're going to stay right down here to the tip of the lateral malleolus. And we should see the tendons in this order. Perineus brevis, closer to the bone, so B for bone, and perineus longus, which actually has the longest way to go. So you can see the perineus longus drapes underneath and goes underneath the cuboid laterally all the way to its enthesis on the base of the first metatarsal. Unless clinically indicated, uh, we don't scan anything beyond the cuboid. Uh, we tend to stay out here laterally just to cover the zone of interest that's painful. There is a lateral muscle belly here to the plantar, sorry, to the perineus longus, and that should not be confused with uh, excessive fluid. If anybody has a very long distal muscle belly, um, try to compress it and make sure it does not compress. Don't confuse that for a tenosynovitis. Again, you can use anisotropic artifact to your advantage if it's very hard to uh, delineate which tendon is which and uh, if, if pathology exists in here or not. Just tilt that transducer and you can make out the margins of the, of the uh, perineal tendons very well. If you find structures within the anisotropy that do not turn dark, you could be dealing with intrasubstance or older scar tissue that is no longer longitudinal in its fiber orientation. So scar tissue will still lay down um, fibrin within this normal tendon, but it won't be longitudinally oriented like a healthy tendon. So. Uh, in this case in particular, anisotropy really helps to show that this entire, um, these two tendons are normal because I don't have a lot of hyperechoic material existing within the anisotropic artifact. A split tear is pretty fun. Um, this is a dynamic maneuver you want to do. And you actually want to use a lot of gel so you don't cause the tendons not to herniate up on top of a malleolus or otherwise obscure the pathology that you're looking for. But basically what happens is the perineus brevis sits up against the malleolus until you roll the ankle, and the perineus longus will herniate into the perineus brevis, causing the perineus brevis to split into two. And we'll see that in this video clip here. There's the perineus longus, and then here's the perineus brevis up against the bone, 
And then as that's rolled there, this is actually on the relaxation phase of this, which might be easier to capture. You can see the, you can actually see the Prinius longus leaving the split Prinius brevis. So I'm just going to use the, the feature on the video clip to rewind and fast forward here and you can actually see that herniation take place very nicely. Here's another example of uh, not only that that herniation that takes place, if the clip will move a little faster, there you go, of trying to keep the transducer pressure right here on the tip of the malleolus if possible so that you don't um, so that you don't lose contact with the surface here. If you've already established that this is not dislocating and that this um, lateral retinaculum of the malleolus is not ruptured, these tendons aren't going to go anywhere, then it's, it's totally appropriate to keep the transducer contact on the lateral malleolus while you do this roll. This is an example of what happens when that lateral retinaculum is compromised. So basically on the dynamic exam you can see that the uh, perineal tendons have perched up on top of the lateral malleolus uh, consistent with a rupture of that lateral retinaculum that holds them down. So this is just an example. If we scan a little distally, we'll actually catch an effusion around these. So this may help you um, in your procedures if you want to do an injection or if you just want to follow the fluid and see if they are coming from another source. When we turn the transducer to a longitudinal orientation, it helps to do this after the level of the malleolus if you're looking for the effusion. Uh, proximal to the malleolus, you will not notice much of an effusion because there's just no room because of that lateral retinaculum. So we're just going to rotate the transducer, probably on the perineus brevis. And we'll move on to the next slide that maps these two uh, tendons out. So this is at the malleolar level. You can see how that long and flat bone uh, abruptly stops. And then you'll actually see the tendons as they turn the corner. Uh, one scanning pearl here is to lean that transducer almost as um, posteriorly as you can right up against the margin of the Achilles tendon. And what that's going to do, because these perineal tendons are actually running up against the fibula, um, they then wrap behind the fibular head here, or the, the distal fibula. They don't go on the side. So what you want to do is create a bony backboard. So we've got the perineal tendons in long axis here. We've got the lateral malleolus here also in long axis. But if you were just to take the slice here, pointing inwards towards the ankle, you would not have this bony reference. So it's very important to have a bony reference in your image anytime you can. And what we've done here is created a bony backboard, pinching the transducer surface with the malleolar, um, with the uh, lateral perineus longus and brevis tendons stacked on top of each other. And then we've also got those tendons sitting on top of the lateral malleolus here. As we go distal to the lateral malleolus, you can see the gel that we've used. Use copious amounts of gel to fill that so you don't get an air gap. But we can see the difference where the perineus longus takes a path around the edge of the cuboid and dives under the, the bottom of the foot versus the perineus brevis, which I think is coming up on one of the next slides, that we would trace over to the uh, base of the fifth metatarsal, which is not seen here in this yet. We were just showing the perineus brevis effusion at this point. There we go. So this is the base of the fifth metatarsal scanning. And what I recommend you do is you place a finger behind that, that little tubercle that exists on the outside edge of the base of the fifth metatarsal. And then you set your transducer in front of the finger. So you want to palpate the back of that metatarsal first, and that will help you land directly on top. Now I use the gel a lot of times as a pointer. And so what I did was I laid down a big bead of gel right up to the posterior margin of the lateral malleolus. And what that did was draw a straight line from the base of the fifth metatarsal to the back half of this uh, fibula showing the direction that I expect to see the perineus uh, brevis tendon. And when I set the transducer down, this is the image that you should get. So this is the base of the fifth metatarsal. This is the bottom of the cuboid and the calcaneus. And here we've got a really nice outline of the perineus brevis.
onto the medial ankle. Uh, just a couple of basic structures here. We usually look for tarsal tunnel syndrome or any other tendinopathy. Um, I've already explained kind of what to look for for tendinopathy in the Achilles tendon, so I expect you to do the same thing for the posterior tibialis tendon and the flexor digitorum longus tendon and the flexor hallucis longus tendon. So, with that said, I'll skip forward to uh, common nerve entrapments on the medial ankle, such as this um, tarsal tunnel syndrome. So here we've laid out the diagram, and we've got, uh, you could even go through the mnemonic of labeling these um, medially, which would be um, Tom, Dick, and very nervous Harry. So we've got tibialis, digitorum, and for artery, vein, nerve, and very nervous, hairy, halysis. So if it helps you remember those things, that's a really good way to do it. Longitudinally, what we're looking for are things like this. This is a normal um, appearing nerve. It's nice uh, parallel fibers until we come across something that is a schwannoma. So in your classification, when you're scanning things and you see something wrong with a nerve like this, you want to be able to tell if it's within the fascicular structure or if it's extra fascicular, is it eccentric or eccentric, and those are classifications that will ultimately help um, a potential surgeon that's working on the case. Another common cause for tarsal tunnel syndrome is a flexor hallucis longus effusion or any other space occupying mass such as a ganglion cyst. But in this uh, case, we're going to talk about the FHL effusion. So up here, same um, tarsal tunnel shot. Uh, this is a normal FHL, fairly normal. It's a little thick and around the um, synovial wall. But here is one that's obviously got a lot of diffuse um, tendon sheath swelling. There's not a lot of detail. It's kind of slough looking. And as we go on further, we want to see the extent of this effusion. What looks like a really big balloon did not get there naturally. And I'm going to show you a dynamic maneuver that will allow you to see your FHL effusions really nicely if you suspect one. So if you start to see, I'm going to go back a slide, a very vague uh, diffuse effusion like this and you want to delineate it a little bit better, what I recommend uh, moving forward is that you give pressure to the arch of the foot with your thumb, the opposite hand. And when you do that, what you're going to do is force the effusion from the not of Henry portion here medially where the FHL and the FDL um, intersect with each other, you're going to push your thumb right up here into the arch of the foot and you're going to cause all of this effusion that has pooled and collected distally uh, to squirt more proximally. So we're forcing the effusion to actually occur proximally right here by applying that pressure. This is really important to uh, differentiate these fluid collections because you can actually have a subtalar joint effusion. So if this, is, if this is our tibia and this is our talus and then this is our calcaneus, you can have a subtalar joint effusion that actually um, communicates with the FHL sheath in, in a certain percentage of the population. So you want to be able to differentiate where the fluid's coming from, whether it's isolated to the synovial capsule or if it's uh, coming out of the intraarticular portion of the subtalar joint. Moving to the next slide, uh, posterior tibialis tendon tear doesn't occur very often, but when it does, it's pretty easy to see the disruptions in these tendon fibers here. We've outlined them here in this little cartoon, um, but oftentimes these, these tendons will get so close together that the spaces between the tendons will start to look like a tear. So you really have to trace up and down the tendon to find out that the tendon is in fact torn. For the anterior recess, uh, just to stick to the basics, uh, just to keep this lecture short and sweet, uh, we're just going to show what a normal, um, or what I should say, an abnormal joint effusion would look like. So this is the distal tibia, this is the talus, and you can see the cartilage right here. You won't normally see the cartilage. Um, the, the cartilage will normally look kind of gray and shadowed, but when there's a nice effusion lifting up all of this fat, and this is a fat pad, so this is the equivalent of a fat pad sign, um, what happens is that you can see that the fluid enhances these echoes on top of this rim of the cartilage, and this is called a cartilage interface sign. This is really useful to target an injection where people would come in this way and just drop the needle right underneath the transducer surface into the um, superior tailored dome area.
a real quick look at the MTP joints and what we're looking for for something like uh, arthritis. Uh, we see normal, not normal, we see uh, joint effusions quite often in the metatarsal phalangeal joints. This is the distal metatarsal head and the proximal phalanx coming together much like they do in the hand. There's a joint capsule and in this case uh, the extensor tendon right underneath here is the um, a joint effusion that is compressible so be on the lookout for those things. They do make uh, joint injection much easier when there's a little bit of fluid. This is something that we look for for gout. Uh, we see a lot of tophus, we see a lot of um, abnormal erosions in the bone, um, we see a lot of color activity such as color power Doppler within the joint capsule um, outlining all that all that uh, very swollen synovium almost looks like a cauliflower and then we wanted to prove that what we were seeing was not just an excessive amount of color gain and in more advanced training scenarios you want to learn how to prove that what you're looking at is truly information by using pulse wave Doppler which is a feature on the machine that will quantify flow and prove that it's not an artifact Morton's neuroma, real quick on this, it's, it's um, where you set the transducer there on the plantar or dorsal surface of the foot and we're looking for a growth within the nerve in the inner digital space and we want to be able to classify what the pain is. So here we've got just a case of a very diffuse growth that sits, um, right now the transducer is superficially here on the dorsal portion of the foot and that can often um, be an easier scanning window than the plantar portion of the foot. The plantar portion of the foot often has very dry skin, it's very thick, and I tend to start on the dorsal portion of the foot first before moving my way to the plantar portion. So if you start at the dorsal portion, it's easier to scan through, and then you just want to apply pressure with your thumb to the plantar portion of the foot and try to get these tissues to compress on each other, and uh, you want to do that in, in, in between each of the webs. And what you're looking for when you push your thumb up towards the transducer is um, these little ovals here. So this is an interdigital nerve and it's got a very fatty growth around it consistent with the Morton's neuroma, with the patient's symptoms, this burning, and it's typically between the second and third webs and that's what we're seeing here. So this is the first web, second, and here's the third web and then we can see the intermetatarsal ligament here. Um, these nerves border that ligament and if you're questionable of what you're looking at, throw color on there and you'll notice that these nerves run adjacent and uh, parallel with arteries. So if you're wondering if you're seeing a, a blood vessel or not, just throw your color on there and see if, um, see if what you're looking at is in fact a blood vessel. Now you can go on the long axis and provide a similar amount of pressure and roll your thumb between the intermetatarsal space. And here what we want to do is decide whether or not we're dealing with what's actually more of an intermetatarsal bursitis where you have uh, a fluid gap that exists that sits between the um, metatarsal heads. Here we're kind of blanching the intermetatarsal ligament. These two layers here and then here's a normal appearing nerve on the plantar surface and you can see that normal appearing nerve still just rolling with the tissues. Um, I don't see this normal appearing nerve grabbing any of this like the diffuse hypoechoic neuromas would. So this just appears to be more of a bursitis and it's very collapsible. See how it's changing its shape very easily. Um, so you just want to make sure that you're not overcalling neuromas in what could be an intermetatarsal bursitis.